Hello, everybody. I have Carl and Sean with me today, and we're going to be talking about the idea of enterprise adoption of digital transformation. And this is going to be kind of a special two-part episode, or a, I was calling it a crossover extravaganza earlier. Um, so we're going to have one conversation here on the Digital Transformation Talks, and then pass it over to the two of them and their show. So we'll make sure that we tag each other and you can follow along on our journey, but the next video we'll be posting next week as well. Um, before I dive into the questions that I have for you gentlemen, let's start with Sean. Can you give everybody a quick introduction and then we'll come to you, Carl? Absolutely. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Sean Achipong. I am the founder of To Me Transformations. Uh, I actually specialize in helping companies digitally transform, uh, starting with a records management uh, approach and then helping companies better understand the management of their data, the processes that come from creating that information, uh, cultural change, technologies used, and then corporate-wide adoption. And I've had the priv privilege of doing this over a 20-plus year career in a variety of different industries from government, police, energy, sales, uh, banking, insurance, um, engineering, so a lot of different industries. And uh, yeah, so it's led me to create my own small business, uh, To Me Transformations, where I get to do what I love, helping organizations transform uh, at a full-time capacity. So thank you for having me, Emma. Yeah, tag, you're it, Carl, your turn. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> no problem. Uh, Emma, thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Carl Reed. I am the principal consultant of my company, Catalyst Consulting. I'm a process engineer by design, so I work on digital transformations very similar to my colleague, Sean, uh, in multiple areas from finance, to logistics, to retail, to healthcare. And what I do is focus on the process flow, the customer's journey, the patient's journey, and then um, apply uh, enhancements through continuous improvement as well as automation. And I'm always challenged or most likely, or most often inspired by anyone that says it's never been done before. That's where I get most excited and I get to work. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, and thank you both for joining me. So I want to get started. I mentioned um, in that introduction that we're talking about this idea of enterprise adoption. Um, but I want to come to you, Carl, with the first thought to kind of set the stage of why are we having this conversation and why do you feel like a purposeful adoption strategy is something that's critical for digital transformation success? Uh, well, because <laughs> that's a great question, but purposeful uh, is a great way to put it. Um, it's because we're going to be going through what is not uh, a smooth journey whenever you're going through any digital transformation uh, and uh, developing a vision for any organization. And so you do have to have a purposeful I guess, methodology to increase that, uh, that adoption. There needs to be an involvement from the very beginning, an alignment uh, to what we're going to do. And you want to have very strong um, uh, adoption, uh, embracing that digital transformation vision. So uh, you want that not only because it's the rigor, it's the methodology, it's what my I've been taught and trained to do, but it's not always smooth, right? So if you have this uh, concepts of adoption, uh, the foundation at the very beginning, it will something you lean on <laughs> when you go through a digital transformation that has maybe small inter iterations of success, but not the large success. So you need to have that same, um, I guess, uh, rigor all the way through. So there's people that are going to go through the fear of unknown. Um, the changes are going to happen. It's going to impact them from day to day. They're going to be hesitant to accept. Uh, I like the phrase where someone says, yes, I'm on board, Carl. Um, change is amazing. I, 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 I love this concept. How about you go first? Right. So, <laughs> right. So there is going to be that up and down those those uh, periods where you're going to have to rely on the engagement, the uh, relationships that you made earlier, and then that rigor of adoption, that involvement, the alignment, the the insurance that um, they are included in this decision and also part of the uh, solution as well going forward. So it's really important to have that right from the beginning. 
Wonderful. And Sean, were there anything, thoughts that you had that you wanted to kind of add to the the reason that we've brought this little trifecta together to talk about this idea? Absolutely. And I guess to add to what uh, Carl's saying, um, I like to boil it down to the people and the value and the problem that's being solved as key fundamental pillars to bring about adoption. It's one thing to have a really cool technology um, or a new perceived way of working, but first from a, you know, putting myself in the, sh in the shoes of a consumer, I always want to know, well, what's the problem that's being solved and why would I personally um, adopt this new way of working? Um, I find that to, we can't really have adoption unless people are um, part of that journey and getting a chance to experience it, touch it, and develop their own perceived value um, to, to, to make it really grow and flourish and become a, a new way of working. Um, even something simple today, like yesterday my wife brought in a new can opener that was way easier to use than the previous one we had where I'm like sitting there cranking on the uh, thing trying to open cans. I'm like, this thing is a pain in the butt. And um, just bringing a new technology or new way of the can opening the uh, the cans made it a lot easier and smoother. And so I quickly said, well, out with the old can opener and, and in with the new. Um, I am simplifying it down considerable too. Uh, but but that's the, the overarching premise, you know, that there's a problem and I'm seeing a perceived value and me as a person, you know, I could see myself using this uh, going forward. Um, the other thing that comes to mind very briefly is that um, innovation begets more innovation, you know, and we've, we're seeing that now play out in a taxi service, in, um, in cars. Cars are going through a massive evolution and energy for our homes are going through a massive um, transformation in itself or innovation in itself, once we reach a new um, uh, bar then and people start to adopt and use it, it only begets another one down the road and another and another. So I, I feel that people are fundamental um, to, to that digital transformation journey and um, it only creates that, that, uh, that snowballing effect down the road. You're speaking my language if we're talking about people and obviously I'm pretty passionate about change management, which is part of the reason that we wanted to have this discussion. Um, so as we were brainstorming for this conversation, we were talking about what are the different tactics across the board that we use to support this idea of enterprise adoption with our customers. And Sean, you brought up an idea that I think is so cool, and I haven't taken advantage of this with my customers yet, but I may be stealing the idea, but it was this idea of a 20 minute workout. Can you explain that concept and kind of how it's used in that adoption methodology with your customers? Absolutely. So with uh, one of my customers um, working with an organization that's quite long tenured, you know, they're going on about 100 years, 98 to be exact. And I find they have very deeply set in ways of working, cultural ways of working. And they definitely want to improve. They want to digitally transform. They want to innovate and get rid of the paper. And their day-to-day -day schedules are incredibly packed, as we know, like every 30 minutes, every hour, there's a meeting on the books. Um, but then there's these long-standing issues with the current tools they have, be it Word, Excel, Outlook, SharePoint, um, Zoom. Um, a lot of the tools they have, they're using them, but not using them to their full capabilities, or there's long-standing errors or issues with using it. So when I approached this organization, I was like, Okay, they have long-standing issues, they want answers, but we're, we're, we don't have the time. So in place of organizing three-hour training sessions, you know, that we sit in and see a talking head and move on, I said, what if I try a micro-educating approach where I'm just baking in 20 minutes once every two weeks to go over a really hot topic? And I framed and I, um, I coordinated these 20-minute workouts that occur every second Wednesday for 20 minutes. I begin and end on time. And uh, we just focus on one topic at a time. Um, my drive where I get a lot of these topics with this organization, I'm working inside of the technology. So I get 
access to um, help desk and tickets and um, and people know my background in records management. So there's a lot of questions and uh, uh, that, that bubble to the surface. Well, how do I digitize um, files and ensure they're accessible 30, 40 years from now? Or um, how can I co collaborate a, a meeting and we don't have access to an in-person whiteboard, but do it electronically? So I break down topics into bite-sized pieces. And um, I've also framed out these workouts as um, the code word I use is POPs. So it's become vernacular. <laughs> yeah, it's become a vernacular that's used amongst the team now, where it's like, hey, when's the next 20-minute POP session? Um, yeah, so it's, and it's going really well. I've been doing it for close to um, three, um, three quarters right so far um, over many months. And what I'm seeing is that people who are attending the POP sessions um, are now leveraging some of the bite-sized learnings in their day-to-day. -day. So I'm seeing improvements in how they use, be it um, SharePoint or other technologies that they use, and um, or they're recanting some of the things that they've learned uh, from these sessions. So it's become an invaluable way to gradually improve productivity and performance and solve problems that have been lingering for a really long time, uh, all broken down into 20 minute sessions. So I'm quite happy with the way it's going. There's two pieces there that you mentioned. One is just the 20 minute bite size. I think I speak for maybe everybody in the entire universe at this point when I say that my attention span has been significantly impacted by the changes that we've seen in the last year or so. Um, so that idea of really distilling that information down into these bite-sized pieces helps with that significantly. But then also you mentioned this little nugget of gold, <laughs> the idea that you start and end on time every single time. So now you've set that precedent that this is going to be 20 minutes and it's, that's all it's going to be. And come join us, we'll talk through this idea and you'll hopefully get something of value out of every one of these in that 20 minutes. And I think that makes it very consumable for somebody that is a little hesitant to change because it's not this big, like you said, big three hour training or this heavily complex technical thing that they're gonna have to hyper focus on. It's 20 minutes of digestible information at a cadence that happens on time and they know that you're respecting that time and it just makes it a really safe space to learn. So I think that that's a, a really, I mean, whether it's technology or anything else that you're trying to get adoption for or help communicate within a company, I think that that's a really great strategy, especially in current climate while we're all working remotely. Carl, I want to talk to you about some of the, the tactics that you've um, developed, especially now in this current environment for managing this type of, of change and, and what you've found success with um, in these avenues as well. Yeah, absolutely. But but first, I, I have to hand it to Sean. I love the concept. The third thing I would add, Emma, is the pops. Like the immediately my mind goes to uh, digestible, you said, um, bites of information, <laughs> uh, I think of food. <laughs> so I think this is like, it's our morning pops meeting or it's our afternoon pops meeting. I, I absolutely love it. Like, you know, it's time for people to converse together and share information. I love that. Like, it's almost like sharing information over a dinner table. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But uh, to answer your question, I have something um, similar to that. Um, where I use, since my tradition as a process engineer, I use process flow, either uh, consumer journey or customer journey as a way to articulate uh, bite-sized information, if I can take your words there, uh, Sean, where I'm demonstrating the, the impact or the effort or the, the journey that this digital transformation is going to either automate or um, you know, make it leaner or uh, make it more innovative. And so what I use is, and I, I'll probably share it uh, so you can display on your screen at, at some time, but I use a, a process flow map. It's like a one pager that incorporates the process flow in some of the major chunks of activities for everyone that's involved. But then I identify with those users that are mostly impacted, mostly you know, know the lay of the land that are in the trenches and doing the work, feedback from them to call out gaps and, and improvement opportunities and areas of focus. 
And why I do that is when it's done, you're demonstrating like a heat map. You're showing everyone, here is the uh, current state. Here's the where the effort is going to have to be made. So you can literally see, oh, in step number, you know, three and four, that's where the majority of the work and effort is going to take place. So in one, it demonstrates to everyone the effort, all right? This is not going to be an easy task. There's going to be some iterative changes that has to happen. And you can see the second thing, you can see the amount, you can see the number of gaps or improvement opportunities that's going to uh, happen. But it shows their words. It, it it encourages everyone. And again, that adoption concept, you're actually seeing a user talk about their pain point and it's on the board. It's it's on this giant view of, of the process. So they see their involvement in there and then they can tell that once we get to a certain stage and we have these small successes, these small celebrations, they can see, oh yeah, gap number nine, that's my area that's specifically such a pain. It is now gonna be resolved at this timeline. So I like to use that. Um, and very similar to Sean, it is a weekly review or iterative review where we see the progression. Um, also, I'm, I'm Jamaican. I'm a Jamaican Canadian. So we love color. So in this map, I'm also demonstrating the getting ready from red to amber to green to blue, right? It just shows succession of progression. And so you not only do you see the ability of the impacts, the effort, but you see how it's transitioning from that was m mostly red now going to yellow, now going to green, and then finally blue means that we're reaching completion. So it, uh, it's a good way to demonstrate the effort. It gets people's involvement because they see their own words, their own uh, pain points up there, but it allows us to see the transition and celebrate those wins. Wonderful. I like that. I'm a fan of color as well, um, <laughs> this little Wisconsin girl. But <laughs> um, we, I definitely, I think that that is just what you were saying, having that ability to tap into the insights of the team and make sure that they can graphically see that those insights are being um, included in how your transformation is taking place creates a sense of ownership for every person that's involved in that process. And even if they're not the one that named it to put it on the board, chances are there's something there that speaks to them and the pain points that they're having and gives them that ownership and kind of links back to a little bit of what John was saying in the idea of why is adoption important. It's to help drive that point of what's in it for me forward. And the more that you can bring forward those ideas and put them in front of people and remind them of the impact that this change is hopefully going to have or positive impact that this change is going to have on their life and what their role is. I think the more powerful that kind of change management process is across the board. So absolutely. And, and even to add to that, I'm sorry not to cut you off, but even to add to that, even to add to that, you start to see your fellow brethren, you see their world and their impact. So if you're doing work that's downstream impacting them, you also get to see what it's like on, on, on from their perspective too. So even if your pain point's not there, you see your others that have that pain point and you're also eager to make that change to make it easier for your, for your team. So the last thing that I wanna to touch on today, and I'm gonna open this up to Sean first and then come to you, Carl, a little bit. This is one tactic that all three of us have found success with, and it's the idea of using a triage process to help support um, scaling and kind of that iterative process that we've been talking about within a transformation. So Sean, do you wanna talk a little bit about how what that triage process means to you and how you found success with it to get us started? Sure, sure, I can definitely uh, share my thoughts on it. Um, so the first thing I find is that there's, <clears throat> there's some criteria or problems that have been linking with organizations for a long time, or there's definitely a direction that they want to go. So first thing I do is I funnel um, to what body of future direction as well as current problems um, are more strategic in nature. So they're big, big, hairy, audacious goals or they're long-standing problems. And I use that at a strategy kind of layer. And uh, from that, then we break it down into specific projects and then quick win opportunities. So that's the high-level framing. And now let me break it down a little bit further. 
Um, <clears throat> at the, the macro level, uh, one of the things that I look for is the overall business or customer impact. Um, and I kind of use, um, I use a chart to, to evaluate. So with the business impact being high, medium, or low, and then on the bottom layer, I look at our overall understanding of how to solve the problem. And I also grade that in a high, medium, low. And that's pretty important because it's one thing to opine and envision a world that doesn't exist. It could, you know, in some respects seem like bo boiling the ocean. Um, we want to get to a new world, a new way, but um, if we don't have an understanding of how to solve that problem, it could be very well just pie in the sky thinking. Um, and on the other spectrum, if we have a low, um, if there's a low impact to the customer and a low understanding of how to solve the problem, then it begs the question, why bother? And Really, so what I do on this chart is I try to identify quick win opportunities and projects by first grading it based on um, what's the overall impact to the business and the customer, um, followed, followed by our overall understanding of how to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, bring one layer lower. So that's how I start out shaping at the top level to understand strategy and projects. And out of that, you know, you'll have projects and you'll have potential quick win opportunities. And I like to frame that as well. Um, so I have criteria that I use. So if it's something quick win for me is something that's easy to implement fast, um, it's very inexpensive, um, we could potentially reverse it as needed. And it's within the team's control. So like we have the skills at the table um, or we, we don't have to acquire new resources necessarily to, to solve it. So that's my that's my general framing. So impact, um, ability to, to solve the problem, and then from that you have projects as well as quick wins, and then I use that five criteria there to evaluate, come up with a, uh, with a ranking with a collaborative team, and um, then we prioritize and, and execute from there. So. Great. And Carl, you go ahead and outline how your process maybe differs or how that looks the same. It's pretty similar to kind of how we found success with it. I would say the criteria to like, you know, actually be able to make the change kind of comes down to like in our world, we talk about that of like difficulty of change, <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of impact. So it's a pretty similar process from our perspective at Navient, but I'd be curious to hear Carl, how yours is similar or different. Uh, yeah, it's actually quite similar. Um, I do use an impact effort, um, high impact, low effort uh, to launch. Um, I also use a, a, um, a very similar chart to what Sean mentioned. I use Kano analysis to determine the relevance to the consumer, um, the, the customer, uh, or anyone else that's involved in the process. So anything that falls in the basic component and basic is sort of define that any essential or expected requirement of this particular gap, improvement opportunity or, or solution. Again, leveraging what I said, where I have a heat map of all the gaps and improvement, we start to prioritize that based on that. And if it falls in that bucket of basic, that is considered one of the priorities that we, we put at a, at a higher uh, level um, when we're rating it with, with our team. Of course, using data, but definitely with a rating system, uh, simply because it's an expectation at this stage that this organization should be already achieving, or they should be functioning at this level. With as it as if it's missing, it can cause incremental damage to the brand. It can cause impact uh, to the customer, to the consumer. Uh, and so negative that they would maybe not utilize this process again or be involved with this with this brand. So we triage it like that. And then the next one up is a satisfier. So it's just a little bit higher where we're making maybe an addition to the process. Uh, so further, this is where you, we talk about automation, right? So if we have the basic right, then that's when we start moving to some areas where can we automate this and reduce um, errors of impact and uh, reduce maybe timelines. And then lastly, the, the delighters. So those are the concepts where no one's expecting that, let's say from a consumer perspective, but when they 
encounter this process, this innovation, they're really, really uh, happy for it. It's almost like we've achieved that basic, that satisfaction, and now we're also getting that loyalty from the, cu the customer or the consumer. So that's where you start thinking of some more innovative components. We're adding, not even added on, we're going to a new net new uh, concept that uh, maybe goes after new population of customers, but also uh, enhances um, their involvement within the process. Wonderful. I love hearing how other people are doing this and where it is similar to how we approach it and, and maybe some tips and tricks that we can pick up and implement on our end as well. Um, I appreciate both of you joining me for the conversation today. And like I said at the beginning, this is only <laughs> so next week we will be releasing part two. So make sure that you kind of are following all three of us so that you see while that is shared um, and reach out to any of us with questions that you've got about some of the tactics and promise both of these gentlemen are more than willing to share their knowledge and help help you navigate the world of adoption as well. So thank you both for joining me today and uh, we'll see you all next week. If you're looking for expert tips on how to get started with your transformation or looking to hone in on your approach, make sure that you subscribe to our channel to catch our weekly digital transformation talk series where we interview experts from around the world on how to make it happen.